The following is a conversation with Valérie Whittaker, the head of art at Trillitech, which is the London hub of the Tezos ecosystem, composed of a vibrant artistic community and focusing on verticals such as art, gaming, DeFi and sport. We talked about the Tezos Foundation, the recent partnership with the Musée d'Orsay, the digital souvenirs, the impact of blockchain on art, and the future of NFTs in the art industry. Now, dear friends, here is Valérie Whittaker. Okay, Valérie, well, it's a pleasure to have you here at Thanks Station so F. Um, <laughs> so to sum it up for the audience, you are the head of art at Trillitech. Uh, so can you explain your background so we get to know you a bit better? Of course. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. I am head of art at Trillitech, which is a London hub of the Tezos ecosystem. Um, as many of the people within the Tezos ecosystem know, there are several different offices around the world who promote adoption, engineering, product design, core engineering. Um, and the London hub is called Trillitech. Everyone has a different name, so it can be a little bit confusing. But in general, the heads of the different verticals are based at Trillitech, including art, gaming, uh, DeFi, uh, sp and sports. Um, so I work very closely with my colleagues on that. My background is really in commercial art dealing. So I was an art dealer and a gallerist for nearly 16 years before joining uh, a Web3 company um, and really fell in love with the idea of new technologies, with the blockchain, with Tezos in particular, um, because of the inefficiencies I saw in the traditional art market. And it's a very slow moving market, the traditional um, commercial industry, but there's inefficiencies that have existed for a really long time. And I saw blockchain in particular, uh, as a solution for that. Uh, Tezos was an obvious, um, attractive ecosystem with a vibrant artistic community, um, platforms building on it that really were catered to those inefficiencies and overall just a, a really great team that was looking to help change the world for the better, really. Yeah, okay. Good uh, Good to, to hear about all that. Uh, recently, what you did is the Tezos Foundation uh, did a partnership with the Musée d'Orsay. So it's a big partnership so because the Musée d'Orsay is one of the biggest museums in the world. Um, so can you explain this partnership where, to us so we better understand what it is all about? Of course. Um, I should mention that the the partnership and the idea of um, the museum using new technologies really started with the leadership in the museum. Um, it's They've been really vocal about wanting to integrate new technologies uh, with, with the president, um, Monsieur Christophe. Uh, and then um, the group sought new forms of education and, and resource development. Um, the WAC Labs team in particular uh, really was the genesis of the dialogue between the museum's teams, platforms, um, technical builders, wanting to really explore what the full opportunity set of, of the blockchain could be for an institution of that size with its audience, especially its international audience, its audience of different age ranges. Um, and really, I came in much at the later stage to really make sure to catalyze uh, all of the ideas that, that the museum had. So it's a partnership that comes out of a very authentic journey of initiative from the internal teams, uh, looking to resources and education, which, you know, the WAC Labs Fellowship has, has done an excellent job of, of promoting for a variety of institutions. And then really looking then at the technical integration, platform usage, leveraging uh, the creator community as well, um, which is which is to come um, and, news, and news to be uh, announced in the coming months. Um, Yeah, and it's 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 a partnership that for the Tezos ecosystem is meaningful because it really represents one of the world's top major museums, an older collection as well, a collection that knows that its collection is old, but to remain a relevant contemporary museum and engage new audiences that new technologies are essential. And that that really comes from the the words of Guillaume Hu, who we've been working really close with, and, and Constance Marlev. Um, so yeah, the, the partnership is, is from a really authentic dialogue that's been happening for many, many months, and it represents both that institutional 
positioning, that institutional authentic collaboration, as well as a testament to the Tezos ecosystem as one that has been recognized for its advances in arts and culture, most notably with the creator community building on Tezos. Yeah, a lot of things are changing in the cultural world. That's true. And for the best. Um, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kero created for the Van Gogh uh, exhibition at the Musée d'Orsay uh, Digital Souvenir. So this souvenir, digital souvenir are secured on the Tezos blockchain. Um, what's your perspective on uh, digital souvenir? How do you think it can benefit people and cultural institutions best? So a digital souvenir in and of, of it itself is not, um, it's not so overly complicated. It's elegant. It's beautiful. You've created a solution that's also very engaging. I mean, when you look at what you can do with the AR view of La Palette, um, I think it, it really engages different people with what a digital souvenir could be. So I'd first of all like to thank your teams for really thinking outside the box on that because it's yeah. really essential not to copy and paste models in their nascent form and to really build upon ideas. And I think that's been done really elegantly. Um, I think for digital souvenir at large, um, I always approach institutions with the idea of what does your audience need and want? And digital souvenir can be one of a hundred different types of things. And it, it really is about making sure to give audiences a new way of interacting with a collection, interacting with an institution, and of course for the institution to interact in a new way with its audiences. At the very basis, I think that's the, the core of the conversation, but I do think that there's a lot that we're going to see from your teams, from other institutions who try to create their own sort of NFT and digital souvenir programs internally that might explore different ways of using it. I think we're at the very beginning of this story. Um, so it's it's I think it's really important for everyone to know that the the horizon has only just been reached um and i i can't wait to see what else is coming from from your teams as well yeah with all these digital initiatives um including digital souvenir what does it mean for the wider art and culture world because like new technologies are being adopted so what does it what does this bring in terms of value to digital creators for instance my view is that everyone starts out their life as an artist. Everyone gets their first box of crayons. Everyone learns how to dance to their first favorite song. Everyone, you know, engages in different types of creative activities, including gaming, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not even saying it's necessarily art per se, but we all have creative perspectives from a very, very early age. And the way that the entire world operates means that at some point we have to pick a bucket and we have to pick Uh, a particular axis of concentration. What these types of new technologies and innovations mean is that not everyone has to pick an axis or a journey that they'd rather not. It opens up more doors for people who really do want to engage with creative collector, uh, creative content generation, for instance, or who want to build collections and leverage those collections and be really active in the patronage scene, um, can actually do something completely different. You know, 15 years ago when I started my career, this job that I'm doing now didn't exist. And this is that, but on hundreds of times the scale for creators, for collectors, for designers, for people who want to collaborate with other mediums. And for institutions and culture, arts and culture, specifically institutions, I think this presents an opportunity to really show that even in a 19th century context, there's a reinterpretation that can happen with new eyes, new ears, new audiences um, that's very, very relevant to the time. When it comes to the creator community on Tezos that I've come to know over the past, wow, year and a half, Um, I, I truly believe that their passion, their innovative spirits, their talent um, is a completely new foundation that can be leveraged by the future of everyone from the traditional art market, whether it be galleries, auction houses, museums, uh, trading platforms. 
there's material out there that's being made that is going to overwhelm and surprise and transform the way that we look at this content. Uh, so from that perspective, it's not just about the technology itself, it's about the groups of people creating things that are going to change the way that we see the world and how we engage with that. Okay, so that's what your perspective on the role of creative <laughs> content in the Tezos blockchain, uh, uh, in the Tezos ecosystem is? I, I think so. I mean, I whilst not speaking for any individual creative, because I'm not one, I do... I believe in the future of the projects that are being minted there. Um, I think specifically the collaborations, specifically the multimedia, intermedia uh, projects that I'm seeing, th they wouldn't have existed if it weren't for blockchain technology and if it weren't for uh, a group of creators um, who reinforced that confidence that desire for innovation, that boldness. Um, I referenced it at the at the Musée d'Orsay on Friday during our press conference, but I think back to Paris in the 1920s. I think <laughs> back to New York in the 1950s and 1970s, and these were really small groups of people by comparison and temporary artistic movements. But what I'm seeing happen on Tezos, whether it be just the dialogue between artists, which you can read on Twitter, just the engagement that you see on Instagram or within the, the marketplaces, obviously the collecting, obviously the creations themselves. Um, I really do believe that this is a, an authentic artistic movement that's happening in the Tezos community. And that's what's really going to be the most meaningful impetus to... Um, to drive this kind of new engagement from these larger institutions. And there's not just an appetite. There's not just curiosity. There's active engagement and decision-making that's happening now. And that's that's the really positive sentiment we're seeing. Okay, I hope it will have uh, as much positive impact as the movement in the 90s. <laughs> let's, let's see about that. Um, but tell us more about the community uh, and the story of uh, art uh, for... Uh, Uh, for Tezos and on Tezos? So the Tezos blockchain, uh, the, the foundation of the technology was much earlier on, um, but the art community really was catalyzed by uh, someone named Rafael in Lima, who created the first uh, marketplace on Tezos um, early in 2021. And within a month and a half, tens of thousands of creators and collectors were using the Tezos blockchain to create, trade, and collect art. Uh, it was really that simple. It's, uh, but it's also not a movement, I think, that could be recreated for any number of ingredients into a, into a potion. I don't think that's, um, there's a magic to that moment that I don't think can be cre recreated. The story really began there, but I think the endurance, the persistence of that community is really where the meat and substance of Tezos and its community and, and, and creators really lies. Uh, it's been a long haul. We've gone through crypto winter, blizzard, forest fire, whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, but the people making work have taken that and used it as a, as a time to make better work. Rather than trading work that could be traded, people are going back and thinking, how do I make this better so that when I'm, I'm ready when the market is ready? Uh, we saw also last year, at, at around this time, actually, it was October um, 2022, uh, at a panel I was moderating with um, one of the new uh, fair directors of Art Basel. He said something that absolutely moved me nearly to tears, which was that The fairs, the gallerists, the collectors have noticed. But at this point in time, no one's quite created, or at least visibly quite created, a piece of artwork that completely revolutionizes the way that we think about art. Now, the movement itself, as I said before, I think is revolutionary. I think that that's very obviously there and the, the, the undertones of, of that have already been cemented in the course of art history. But no one has put a urinal on its side and called it a fountain. And no one has put a bicycle on a stool and 
tried to call it a piece of art or made furry, you know, sort of mugs and been able to present them in a museum, the Man Rays, the Duchamps, the Picassos of the world are not unlike the people making artwork on the blockchain today. What was meaningful about that comment is really that what he said was that that contemporary art community is looking. And to have the eyes and ears of that community paying attention, ready for whatever it is that's going to unlock that secret understanding of what's going on, I think is, I mean, I know we're a year on and it may not have happened yet, but I really, really think that the Tezos community has put the entire crypto art market in the best position to receive that moment of clarity uh, from the contemporary art market when it's ready to happen. Yeah, it's getting more and more accepted uh, with time, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so how does Trilitech envision, uh, I say it with a French accent, so maybe I should say Trilitech. No, it, it, tous les deux, ça va. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So how does Trilitech envision the role uh, of art in the future uh, for the, um, on the Tezos blockchain ecosystem? So, I mean, of course, you know, the story starting with the community, starting with uh, Hikignunk and the various different marketplaces that have evolved since then, a generative art me movement in particular that has really taken the world by storm. Um, there is an underlying current of simply the creative uh, innovation on Tezos, I think, being superior in many, on many different levels um, to, to other ecosystems not just in terms of quality, but in terms of value systems. And that that does matter. Uh, I think many, many people from the traditional art market might also take a view that it's all about the next dollar. Uh, my experience is that quality, intention, value set, purpose always um, endures more than than other ways of making art. So that's that's one. One is the the creators already making work on Tezos who I think are, are going to be really leading the way. Um, the second is, of course, we have a team at Trilitech that are actively reaching out to auction houses, to institutions, to um, cultural initiatives, to even banks who understand you know, different ways of financing art through DeFi systems. Um, we've in the past also worked with our gaming partners about making sure that creatives have a way of engaging with game designers, right? Like why are game designers game designers when there could be artists uh, consulting on these projects to make them better? Same with sports, uh, introducing some of our sports partnerships to different artists in the ecosystem to see if there's not a way to really... Uh, revolutionize the way that the sports community engages with their with fandom right um i don't think art needs to be quarantined into a certain vertical if <laughs> if if anything it's the vertical that has the most to offer all the other aspects of the blockchain um so that's that's the second and i think the third is really seeing where blockchain technology goes from here you know this is still the verse the very um very initial chapters of Web3 engagement, of how people are using the technology. I wouldn't dare to predict all of the different ways we're going to be able to leverage blockchain technology at this moment. And I think the technology itself is going to go through an evolutionary pro uh, process that's going to help redefine how we, how we communicate, how we collect, how we trade, how we engage as consumers, uh, and that might redefine certain artistic movements as well. Yeah, the things we will see in the years uh, coming, but uh, I'm very like uh, curious to to see what the future will look like. Same. I, I think we're we're at a, a moment in time where it's a bit like Alice in the Looking Glass, where we know where we come from, even at this stage in new innovation, but the launching ourselves through the mirror, it's not unpredictable, but it's a journey that I think will surprise all of us as we as we walk through it. That's true, very true. Um, how do you think blockchain, uh, the blockchain technology changed the way art is created, distributed and consumed? On a very basic level, it enabled peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, 
again, as an ex-gallerist, I understand the function of the gallery, understand the function of an advisor or a consultant uh, that's managing these types of trade. And I, and I think, you know, I see really wonderful people acting as advisors within Web3 ecosystems as well to make sure the right people are connected. But on, the, on a really surface level, on a basic functionality level, artists created great work, create, uh, collectors were able to buy it. Um, expanding from that, I think we're going to see, and, and we have already seen people interested in, what does that mean for leveraging on a loan? What does that mean for borrowing against an asset? I, uh, on a wider scale, if say we're taking a collective of uh, collectors, right? Um, if we're taking an entire institutional collection, what does that mean about what we could do in terms of loaning to other institutions? Um, you know, when we look at specifically the WAC Labs cohort from, from season two, one of the applicants and participants in that program was a consortium of museums in Ukraine who, who's some of whose artwork had unfortunately been destroyed because of the current, cri current crisis. How do we use the blockchain to redefine ownership for an institution like that? Um, to recreate artwork that might be lost, but in a way that's verifiably owned still by the institution, as opposed to just an experimental visual engagement with a lost artwork. Um, you know, there's a lot of different use cases, I think, um, that we'll see moving forward about how blockchain can be used, but um, that peer-to-peer -peer engagement is definitely at the base. Uh, and then forward from that, we're, I think we're gonna have to see how people choose to create new alternatives of communication and engagement with art as well. Um, even just in the like outside tech community, when you look at things like TikTok or you look like things that like Instagram, entire new economies came out of that kind of creative content. And whether or not we'll see an exact reproduction of that on the blockchain, I'm not sure. But I do think there's an opportunity here for us to reevaluate what the price of talent is or what what actually is the return on investment? Is it that your artwork is collected or is it that it's admired in a new way? Is it that it serves a function that it might not otherwise have provided? Um, sorry, I know that's a long-winded answer, but I think it's we're still yet to really, I think, apply all of the different ways that I think we're certain blockchain could, um, could apply for the artistic community. Many new things will appear, that's true, uh, and uh, many of, of those we don't know yet. Yeah. Um, concretely, like, do you still uh, uh, have a, um, a concrete idea of how NFTs can evolve in the future? And do you, do you have uh, some uh, nice use case already? Or do you anticipate certain use cases? I don't want to give away too much, but there's been recent projects that have come to my attention that give me a new understanding of what's possible. Even being at the center of it, sometimes being in the eye of the storm, you don't really see all of the new surprising concepts. I, I love the idea of dynamic, dynamic NFTs. We have a few on Tezos um, that are quite meaningful. Uh, I, I, and a dynamic NFT for everyone who, who doesn't know is something that responds to real world data. Okay. Um, so one particular project uh, by Victoria West, and I, I apologize for not remembering her collaborator, uh, allowed everyone to have voting tokens on how the main NFT would appear. Um, and it was a, a portrait of a woman and it would basically define whether or not she was younger or older in the course of, of the display of, of the NFT. Okay. Um, so to have that kind of changing realized asset that could respond to the weather, that could respond to political uh, movements, et cetera, I think is a really interesting, very direct artistic interpretation. I mean, many artists have their own philosophies that have been set out in text. And if we were to translate these philosophies and apply them in some way that in real time could change 
the way that the artwork appears, I think would be a respectful homage to, to some of these things. So it's very it's a very relevant application uh, creatively. Uh, community and, and almost intimate engagement, I think is another, another one. Um, I've had conversations with different estates of artists who really want to who want to bring new life into the projects that the deceased artist has stopped making. Um, and to do that, you have to, you have to think about who's out there that might like the work, right? Um, the uh, collaboration with Fahey Klein Gallery, the Allen Ginsberg Estate and the Verse Verse platform is another really good example. Partnering with the estate of a major American poet, a beat poet who changed the way that people really saw things in, in the 70s in New York, making sure that their estate authorized the project, number one, that's incredibly crucial. We're not talking about just copying and pasting metadata from like Google Images or whatever, what have you, uh, to make sure that <laughs> there's a, a gallery on board that can help to display a portion of the project and then to have a platform familiar with photography, familiar with art and tech that can leverage that relationship and really create quality outputs. Um, for those of you who haven't read the press about it effectively, um, these three collaborators, along with uh, Ross Goodwin, who's an AI artist, um, have interpreted the entire living work set, the oeuvre of Allen Ginsberg. And the AI uh, technology is working through Allen Ginsberg's photography collection to make poems about the pictures. So it's not a prompt. It's not like you or I could say, you know, my cat is sitting on the couch and it's sunny outside. Please write me a poem by Allen Ginsberg. It's really the technology looking at what he saw visibly with his eyes that he didn't write down and trying to elaborate on his life experience uh, and to create a drop that is hopefully gonna engage a completely new creative collector audience because to this point, at least in the traditional art world, we're seeing it on Tezos, but at least in the traditional art world, poetry is not a collectible. One buys a book, but one does not buy a poem per se. You might buy a single manuscript, but that's arguably a slightly different thing. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we're, we are just at the beginning um, and the use cases that I see and the ones that I really pay attention to are the ones that keep me up at night because I couldn't have thought of them myself. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the future of art collecting. Um, how do you envision the future of uh, art investment, even if these kind of things can not only be some art collection, but some art investment as well? Um, on a larger scale, do you have like uh, insights into the world of art investment linked to the Tezos Foundation, obviously? Um, I won't speak directly to the Tezos blockchain or to any other blockchain at the moment. I mean, I think we're, we're all, everyone who has uh, crypto art in their collection is likely suffering at the moment, but that is the same as any other art recession. You know, I was in the art world when 2008 hit. I was in it when 2011, which promised us everything, also failed. Um, I received some some really important advice from some collectors. And to me, that advice is more than the sum of its parts in that even if individual works in a collection might not make a return on one's investment, the collection is an aggregate unit becomes a story, uh, uh, an object and an oeuvre in itself that no one can deny is of quality. Um, one is that if you really, really, really don't like something, you should probably look at it again. And the reason why is because if it moves you, it's done something good, right? The purpose of art is that you are moved, whether it angers you, it saddens you, it frustrates you, it, 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 it makes you want to throw a piece of glass at it. I mean, these are things that a good piece of art can do. A bad piece of art can't do that. It's not going to make you feel anything. The second is, is really not to, not to give up on artists that you think have potential. Um, even if it's not 
one piece that you think is going to take pride of place in your living room over the fireplace, you know, it's not going to be the, the center of the Medici collection, whatever it might be. If you find an artist who inspires you to collect their work, continue being a patron, continue investing in that artist, make sure that they, they have the ability to have a future, share that artwork. Now in the traditional art market, we didn't do that on Twitter. Um, but in this case, do it on Twitter share what the art the artist is doing and if it's a platform if it's relationships if it's investing in digital souvenirs that are within institutions to show your patronage to an institution at large have faith in that too and the third piece of advice i received whilst i was working at an auction house and it was never ever to lose faith if the market fell off a cliff the market falling off a cliff or an auction house or an auction sale, I should say, not being successful. I mean, at one point you could have had the best curated auction in the world and all that needed to happen was then President Trump had to tweet something and no one would would buy. Right. It doesn't reflect the quality of the artwork, the future of the market, the future of what's going on if one sale goes bad or if there's one really bad day. So within all of those piece of, uh, pieces of advice that I've received, which I'm very happy to share with everybody, um, I think if, if we all take that perspective in this movement going forward, step by step, what we're gonna find is that quality work, uh, innovative work, mind changing work, um, overwhelming projects, uh, great institutions like the Musée d'Orsay, great platforms like Kehu are all going to come together to make this into an aggregate positive outcome. And that, like, I have full faith in, absolutely full faith in. Yeah, that's the strategy that will always win on the long term. Yeah. So it's good that you mentioned it. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges that NFT creators and also NFT collectors face? You've mentioned some of them, but uh, do you have uh, some others in mind? So, I mean, for the creators, it's a really, I think the, the most important, it might be the most basic, but the most important challenge is really being able to make a living. Um, that's historically, you know, since the Renaissance been a conversation, Um, artists prior to the Renaissance, by the way, were always just paid for something, right? You didn't have a starving creative artist making innovative artwork that changed the way people see, saw the world. That There wasn't an economic structure for that prior to that time. Um, though I'm sure there's plenty of art historians that would disagree with me on that. Um, the, the struggle for artists today is going to really be how can I make a living being a creative? And that goes back to that sort of collector di dilemma of continue to invest, continue to trust, continue to be a patron, whether it's sharing, whether it's investing, you know, financially, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another challenge I think is really going to be how this technology evolves. We don't yet have real standards of best practice across the board, whether it's cataloging, whether it's understanding what type of licensing is being agreed upon. You know, not everyone who mints on the blockchain understands the different types of licensing options. Not everyone that mints on the blockchain can speak English and choose the right one, even if they do understand it. We need to have more multi multilingual opportunities. We need to have more regional um, uh, platforms to be able to support these kinds of things and to really think about what can future proof the creations of the people minting on the blockchain. For collectors, there's almost an even bigger hurdle, which is it's very easy to collect 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 NFTs. It's actually not that hard. Um, I've seen people do it. I worry for their sanity sometimes, but I've seen people do it. And my worry for those collectors <laughs> is that without these standards of best practice upon point of creation, the collectors are then burdened with the standard of best practice. What if you want to publish a book of your collection? What if you want to loan your work to a museum? Are you transferring it to a museum's wallet to show the provenance of that exhibition? Because that's fairly risky as far as I'm concerned. Um, are, you, are you then trusting? Do you have a time limit when the museum will 
send it back? Are you going to do an audit on the museum <coughs> security to know that they're not going to have a situation where people are going to steal the NFTs in the exhibition? You know, these, these types of infrastructure questions, whilst they very much mimic the traditional art world and plenty of risks that you know, collectors have to take in the traditional art world. Even at the Van Gogh Museum, I mean, if one travels around the, the exhibition, you'll see loans from museums from the United States, from other places in Europe, from private collections that who knows where they are. These people are all taking a risk loaning the artworks, even if it's to a world-class institution. Um, so yeah, collectors, I think, have an even more important piece of homework to do. How do I want to credit the artist, am I using their Twitter handle or their real name? You know, this is a this is a question that I think is going to endure for the next several years. And, you know, actually in the speeches yesterday um, made by the, the president of the Musée d'Orsay and the Conservateur of the Van Gogh ex exhibition, there was a question around whether Van Gogh signed Van Gogh or Vincent and how that was linked to the roots of the artwork and the journey that he made artistically of how he wove his identity into the paintings. And I think artists, many of them have made that journey. There's a few on Tezos that I know have already really conceptualized this. But it, at large, the again, the standard of best practice has really been defined. Um, and the, the collectors then have a responsibility to maybe ask, to reach out. And if you've got 10,000 NFTs and maybe there's 5,000 different artists in your collection. That's a, it's a really big job to authentically engage with the work in a way where you could loan it to galleries, where you could create an exhibition of work that's not just online on cyber, but is maybe at LACMA, the Pompidou, the Musée, Musée d'Orsay, the Santa Monica Art Museum. These are, these are big questions and a lot of admin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many solutions have to be created to answer these. 100%. So that's good. I mean, a lot of projects to be created. <laughs> that's true. For all the startups out there, that's the, the million dollar ideas are all yours. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of good uh, projects to be created out of this podcast, I think. Um, how can NFTs be used as well to promote social issues and also to raise awareness on other problems? We've seen already, or rather, I should say, it sounds like I'm taking credit if I say we've seen. Um, the, the creators on Tezos have absolutely astounded me with their initiatives, their charitable initiatives. Um, in particular, uh, a group of artists, um, I remember, reached out to me and, and to Arthur Brightman almost immediately when the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria took place letting us know that there was going to be an initiative called an initiative called Tezquake Aid. I understand um, with recent other earthquakes that this charitable initiative has had enduring legs. It's raised, uh, I believe, over 150,000 US dollars to this to date. Um, I, I might want to fact check myself on that, but I'm, it, it was extremely, extremely effective. And rather than doing a crowdfunding page and just having money put out there, the artists themselves made work for the cause to enable all of the patrons of this charitable initiative to have something. And I think that's so meaningful. Like I, it's very, very rare that that takes place. Um, there are exceptions, of course, even in the traditional art market. Um, one great example of that would be the Cure Cubed initiative. Uh, for anyone wanting to Google that, it's C-U-R-E-3. Uh, that's an initiative um, for Parkinson's research. Uh, a, a, I think it's a biannual or an annual uh, auction that uh, has so far taken place at the Bonhams Auction House in London. There were a number of creators um, from the generative art platform on Tezos FX Hash that donated editions that um, were sold at an auction and just on the vernissage, just on the opening night, sold out in two and a half hours making... 250 plus dollars for Parkinson's research. I mean, it, nothing else sold out from that auction. It was really just the Tezos community coming together, Web3 communities at large coming together um, and, and noticing that you could really create value in low prices in volume with a much wider community to bring awareness as well as financial support to these initiatives. Those are just two very small examples. I'm 
really there's dozens on Tezos to speak of, uh, including, you know, supporting individual projects, you know, artists wanting to mentor other artists. I mean, it really, um, it's really, really meaningful and beyond anything I've ever seen in the traditional art world, if I'm honest. That's one of the biggest strengths of uh, actually uh, the Tezos Foundation uh, and the technology itself, like uh, being able to donate and receive something in exchange yeah. still that has value and that uh, may create an emotional connection with the person. We've seen brands do it too. Um, and I should mention that because it's not outside the purview of an institution or a brand, um, Guerlain being one, uh, which here in Paris did a wonderful initiative uh, roughly two years ago with the Paris um, uh, Ecosystem Hub Nomadic Labs, raising money to rewild a forest outside Paris, but also really use their logo in a way that brought attention to lost natural landscapes in the country. And you know, for anyone who's traveled Paris the way, I'm, I'm presuming that you've at least gone on some road trips around France, as have I, True. mountains, canyons, beaches. I mean, the geography of this country for the size that it is, is fascinating. And for a, a, a luxury brand to take, to pay attention to something that has nothing to do effectively with, with what their, their company does. Um, and to say, you know what, we're going to leverage the community that we have. We're going to leverage a technology and we're going to use it for good. And I think the, the, the magnified use case of that that could be presented is infinitely valuable. How do you think can Trilitech really help artists and creators leverage NFTs to promote their work and also to reach new audiences? So the, the Trilitech um, Adoption Hub isn't an advisory as such. Um, it doesn't provide sort of consultancy or advice per se. Um, rather, uh, it's much more, I think it's a, it's a much more simple answer to that is the Tezos community is there. Um, it's open, it's welcome. I mean, even the silly questions that I had to ask at the very beginning of my Web3 journey, whether it was directly to my colleague, Diane Trubé, who I was working very closely with um, at the time when I started, or whether it's meeting the platform builders and meeting certain artists and, and really having some of the most embarrassing non-Web3 native questions to try to get me over the hump of realizing what was possible and realizing the power of the technology, the creative community in, in the way I do now. Um, it's been very transformative. And for anyone who wants to learn about how to making a living, how to make a living minting creative assets or collecting and minting or building a platform or engaging with the traditional art market, um, there are resources. Uh, Twitter is the best place, putting yourself out there, asking it to everybody, getting the feedback from the community. Um, you know, people do reach out to me directly. We now have a, a new community associate uh, as well who's joined, uh, Pranoya10 on, on Twitter, um, who is not gonna be answering individual DMs on Twitter. There'll be a whole different process that's, that's being announced to, to reach out to him. But for creatives, for institutions, um, we, we do wanna be there as a resource and the, and the team is here and we can certainly make all the introductions um, that might be useful. It's a, it's a benefit of not being an art dealer anymore is that I can introduce anyone to anyone else. Yeah, more freedom. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and where would you recommend people to start uh, exploring artworks on Tezos? Oof, um, there are a lot of different avenues. And so to, to really um, prioritize, I would say, you know, using the marketplaces as a, as a resource. Um, you know, we have object.com, which is the largest marketplace on Tezos. It's uh, an indexer. So it indexes all of the projects um, for the secondary market. Uh, FX Hash has become extremely well known as well, um, both inside and outside the Tezos community for its generative art excellence, uh, both as a platform as well as you know curation and exhibition. Um, Taya, which is one of the marketplaces that um, 
was really an OG. I mean, it is the direct descendant, I should say, uh, though active descendant of, of Hikik Nunc. Uh, Versum is another one. And I mentioned before the verse verse, which is exclusively more poetry. Uh, DNS uh, is is a platform that's launching a, a new chapter on um, on music specifically as well. So there's a, there's a number. Uh, the Tezos.com website will be um, hopefully updated in the next few months with uh, a platform specific page and a market a marketplace specific page that will allow uh, anyone the the opportunity to kind of filter through their needs and and what they're looking for. Uh, all of these different marketplaces have evolved over the past 18 months for the better. The the search functions, um, the the ability to sort of prioritize and, and create thematic collections has also improved. And in addition to that, we have um, wallets that are, are coming out with apps as well. The Autonomy Wallet is a really great one. Uh, Autonomy has been working with several different museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, uh, for live minting exercises as well as other projects. And what they've built is really a collector-focused type of wallet where you can filter and curate your own collection, uh, as well as discover other things based on what you already collect, which is really great. Um, the Kukai Wallet, um, which is currently a browser-based wallet, um, is also, also has a great discovery section that allows you to have a, a bit of an Alice in Wonderland journey through the various different verticals as well. So for those who are not strictly art-focused, wanting to go into sports, gaming, um, other types of uh, metaverse journeys, there's there's a lot to explore on, on those different avenues. But hopefully we'll have a bit more of a concise uh, art portal for, for everyone fairly soon. Everyone should be able to find their interest. It's so personalized now. It is. And it's it's a lot. And I understand that it can be intimidating because there's quite a number of different things. But um, the, the only advice I have is take a real deep breath and prepare not to sleep for several days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's what happened to you, right? It is exactly uh, what happened I, to me. <laughs> I, I think that's great because you, you've given a lot of insights about this world. Uh, some people are already very familiar with it. Some people may not be. So thanks to you, I think that we can uh, actually get to know it way better. Um, so thank you for that. And to conclude, I always ask the, the same questions to our guest, which is if you could visit any place, any cultural site or tourist site, where would you go and why? Okay, so I have to admit that the Musée d'Orsay is my favorite museum. So, but we have to we have to put park that to one side because we can't direct and nominate existing. <coughs> existing partners i'm it's a hard one it is a hard one and i'm i'm going to i'm going to be a little bit philosophical about this one and i'm going to say i'm going to say space okay i'm going to say space i mean the, the world is full of cultural institutions and i've had the the absolute luxury of visiting uh, the pyramids of Egypt and the Taj Mahal and, you know, uh, Sterling Bosch in South Africa. And I mean, I, I, I've really, really been very, very blessed with my travel. But at this point, I think we can reach for the stars, right? That's that's the goal. That's true. Um, and to think outside the box, to to know what the stars represent to all of us, right? We make these monuments and these cultural spaces because we want to imagine something that isn't there. We want to imagine something that we we could have never um, foreseen done without our own initiatives. Um, so yeah, if we can we can get some Kehu tokens on the moon, I think uh, I think that's the next step. We could we could contact Oliver Eliasson and Ai Weiwei and tell them that their moon project now needs a cultural heritage token and we'll um, we'll figure that out. Uh, but I, I do mean it. I think the the next step for human innovation is likely going to be in the stars and why not imagine digital souvenir for all of the people going up there yeah that's a great way to conclude, <laughs> to conclude <it. laughs> and honestly thank you so much um you and your teams have been a pleasure to work with it's been a long haul with many many sleepless nights on on your part i'm sure more than ours but um yeah it's been a real pleasure and part of why i think this initiative 
the the overall Web3 project, the overall idea of art on the blockchain works so well is that I continue to meet people and teams that are making a huge difference that really aspire to excellence and to really using this technology in a relevant, purposeful, impactful way. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, a lot of things are going to be created, uh, as we said, in the future. And thank you for all your guidance and support, uh, the Tezos Foundation uh, and you especially. Thank you. So thank you for all, all of this. And yes, I mean, uh, the space tourism is going to develop. There is even a, a company here at Station F that uh, is into this industry. So Things, uh, things are moving that we way. We should definitely conclude this and have a coffee over there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank and, you. Uh, have a nice day. Bye.